Hello, and welcome to Humans of Magic. My guest this week is Eric Froelich. Eric is an American poker and magic player. He has two World Series of Poker bracelets to his name. He's also been a mainstay in the Magic Pro Tour and was inducted into the Magic Hall of Fame in 2015. Most recently, Eric's been grinding the World Series of Poker yet again, following a smooth recovery from open heart surgery. By Eric's own admission, he's had a great run, but he's also had his ups and downs. He manages to get introspective about his reputation and some of the things that he's learned about himself along the way. Kind of a looking back at a storied career in both poker and magic. Please enjoy my conversation with Eric Froelich. All right, Eric, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing good. It's, uh, it's been a long journey to get to good, but I'm doing good now. Let's uh, start off with uh, maybe recent events. What uh, can, for those who may not know, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of um, uh, what kind of a health situation you have been facing recently? And I know you said that kind of spoiler alert. I know you're still <laughs> in the midst of recovery, but maybe just uh, lay it out for us. Yeah, I mean, I've struggled with in some capacity health, but in very clear capacity weight for my entire life. I was overweight as a two-year-old, and I've been overweight my entire life. It's a little bit weird, um, you know, thinking back with a lot of people have stories in their weight loss journey where they, they do have some experience of knowing what it's like to be a more normal weight or then maybe a standard deviation of what an average weight or normal weight might be. And I haven't spent a day in my life like that. So for me, as someone who has tried to lose weight, um, it's hard to say like how much effort I put in at various times, but definitely a lot of effort at various points in my life over the last couple of decades and just struggled with a, with a lot of things. Like at one point, I think when I won my second bracelet, I, I was decently over 400 pounds. I ended up losing over a hundred pounds. And then just, it's been very stagnant from there for kind of my entire adult life. And I, and I don't want to say I've tried everything because obviously I haven't tried everything, but I've done a lot of Weight Watchers type stuff, um, Atkins, keto, all sorts of different low carb diets. I've had personal trainers that I've went to three times a week while doing low carb or low calorie diets for months and months, if not a year at a time. And, um, you know, eventually it would get kind of frustrating where, you know, I, I could tell I was getting healthier. I could tell I was getting stronger, but the numbers never really changed dramatically. And it just kind of became a thing where it's hard to put forth so much effort and not see those results. And so at some point, I would stop in some capacity and I'd start up maybe something new, maybe the same thing again. Um, and so as I get older and want to start a family, it's become more of a priority than maybe it's been at some other points. And so I kind of figured I'm going to start getting tested. I'm going to make sure my health in general is in a place where I'm happy, even if the numbers on the scale aren't exactly where I want them to be. Um, especially as someone who's been married for a long period of time and um, who has a partner who's happy with them aesthetically. It's always been hard for me to be happy with myself aesthetically because I've always been told that, you know, being bigger is not okay. But as long as I was healthy and the numbers were showing that things were in the right spot, then I could focus more on, on that kind of, you know, health and blood pressure and blood sugar levels and, you know, making sure that all of my, you know, vital organs were working like they should be. And so I, I'd been working hard on getting my numbers all in good places and had, had done a really good job of that. And I'd actually had um, gone down to about 270 or so. And so I was losing a little bit of weight kind of slowly and my numbers were in much better places. And so I decided okay, now that everything is kind of looking good and in the right direction, let me make sure my heart is also good. So I got that tested and the results actually came back. It sounded pretty good, but then there was something small that they were concerned about and wanted to do more testing that kind of came up after the fact. And that kind of repeated itself with more testing of like, oh, this does not seem to be working optimally. And so it just kept going down that path kind of further and further until they're like, yeah, the, your heart is just not really 
working correctly. It's not pumping blood the way that it should be. Um, you know, I've struggled with intensive exercise to some degree, and I would always attribute that to being overweight and being out of shape. Like that made sense that, you know, I'm not going to be able to run a lot without huffing and puffing or kind of struggling a little bit more with things that your heart is very responsible for. You know, that that's just kind of stands to reason and, and wouldn't have been alarming to a trainer or anyone else because I'm overweight. Like that's just kind of what you expect. But, you know, there, there were definitely bigger issues and yeah, my heart just wasn't working correctly. I had a, a, a couple different problems with different arteries. And so, yeah, they, they wanted to go in there and actually do the surgery. And so that's been the last six weeks of my life was having the surgery and recovering, um, which was also hard because these tests, I finished them up like a month or almost two months before the surgery itself. So it wasn't like some urgent thing. A lot of heart surgery is very much, oh yeah, have a heart attack. We need to have surgery or, you know, there's, there's something serious going on. And, and there was something serious going on, but it also wasn't like, hey, we need to schedule this out. You know, I had the option to, you know, go to the World Series for the summer and then have the heart surgery afterwards. But also, I didn't know how much, it, you can't really predict when the risk will start to ramp up. Like clearly there wasn't um, enough to have the doctor's concern to schedule it quickly. Cause you know, again, we ended up scheduling it like six or so weeks after the prognosis, but you know, going out and, and playing a game that involved a lot of mental um, focus and, and things like that, knowing that this is kind of looming, didn't seem like the best idea anyway. So, uh, you know, when they, presented me with the options i'm kind of like yeah let's get this done asap like um was there a choice i mean was there an option to elect not to do it and just yeah okay yeah that, that was an option but it was they made it clear that that was a bad option that um you know there, there's very real risk of not surviving anytime you have any surgery but you know a more serious surgery and you know, I didn't really realize when they first told me about this until we went through a lot of the numbers that the odds of something catastrophic happening um, with the heart surgery were very in line with basically any surgery that involves anesthesia. That's where a lot of the risk kind of comes in that, you know, th this stuff is in a lot of ways routine. Like they, they perform so many heart surgeries, like just in the U.S. alone every year, there's like hundreds of thousands. Um and, and yeah, there, I expected that there to be a lot of risk of just going into that kind of area versus anything else, but it, it didn't really add that much to, to the scale versus, you know, any other surgery that you'd have where anesthesia is involved and being someone who's, you know, overweight. Um, luckily, I don't drink or smoke. Those are, I guess, the other two really big risk factors when it comes to anesthesia because they need to use more of it. Um, but yeah, so the risk of something you know terrible happening in the surgery was relatively small and they felt very strongly that the risk of something happening without having the surgery was way higher so at that point it just kind of becomes i don't want to say it's a no-brainer but like you know i want to have a family i want to be around for a long time um last year my youngest uncle of and my mom's one of 10 and my dad's one of seven um, passed away of, of a heart attack after losing a ton of weight and really getting in, in good shape. And so, yeah, it's just, it, it's a scary thing when you're talking about like, you know, this stuff that is just so unpredictable of when it can happen and you're not necessarily going to get good warning signs that like, oh, your heart is going to have a, a massive issue you know, you, you can't go like, it's probably going to be in three days where, you know, it, it's just, it's probably going to happen at some point. And so trying to guess or trying to postpone um, or trying to not have it at all, didn't, none of those options really seem like they made a ton of sense. Um, yeah. Right. And what was going through your mind as you were getting ready to, to have the procedure done? I mean, let's just say maybe I'm sure there are a lot of things going through your mind leading up to it, but what about the day of, as you were, as you know, this is going to happen, like just what's, yeah. It was terrifying. I mean, I've never had surgery, period. I've never had anesthesia, period. Like, didn't really know what to expect. 
Um, man, it's just so like even now that it's six weeks old, it's just so weird to think about the fact that like your body was open, it's almost touching your heart. Like that is a weird mental thing to, you know, it, it's hard to process and. Yeah. And also, I didn't really know, like, you read stories about what recovery is going to be like. And whenever you talk to the surgeons and doctors about anything kind of going on with this, the only thing they kind of talk about is the recovery process. They don't talk about the day of. And for me, mentally, I felt very much that if I survive, you know, if I wake up and everything goes well, you know, like, obviously, there could be complications that like shit happens. I get it. But like. If I'm okay, then the recovery is going to be okay because I'm not, I have a family who, you know, is very caring. My wife was going to take good care of me. My mom flew out from the East coast to the West coast to help take care of me for, you know, the first week. I have a lifestyle and job that is very um, agreeable to to recovery from surgery. I don't have kids. I don't have things I need to be, I don't have to be running around. I don't have a job that requires any kind of strenuous activity involves sitting on a computer typing. And I, you know, it's not necessarily something I need to do right away. You know, I can kind of go at it at my own pace a little bit, or, you know, be able to work in spurts where it's like 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. So yeah. a lot of this stuff and, and the pressures of general life, weren't super concerning to me compared to what I imagined a lot of people have to go through. It's just kind of getting through the event itself. But mm -hmm. the event itself was terrifying. It might have also been the fact that I really struggled looking past that, of looking past, oh, I'm going to be alive afterwards. Because mm -hmm. I didn't, I don't know. I don't know if it's good or bad when it, when you actually break it down that you know, if my wife was trying to make plans for after the surgery, I'm like, I, I don't want to do a lot of that because I don't like assume it. Like, it was hard for me to pro to wrap you're, my head You're really around. zeroed in on like, what, what's the highest risk area? Whereas it feels like the rest of the world is like, let's figure out like there's something less important. And it's just, it sounds like it just doesn't process, you just, your mind just doesn't process it that way. I think, yeah, it was also just like, <sighs> I mean, I've been in the gambling world for 20 years and I played professional magic for 20 plus years. Like just because something is 95% or 99%, like, <laughs> do you know how many times I've lost with a 1% to 5% sure. like, yeah. thousands? Cause I mean, I've been in that spot millions of times over decades and it's just yeah. like, it's hard to not think about a lot of those things. And to take it for granted, like to just assume, yeah. oh, you know, I'm 97% in this game. Yeah. I'm just going to assume I'm going to win. Well, no, you're going to lose 3% of the time. And so for me, I felt like I needed in a there's lot of ways. There's a non-zero. So there, a there's very something non -zero, there. Yeah. Yeah. Like 97% becomes zero if it doesn't happen to you. And 3% yes. because 100, becomes 100% if it happens to you. Right. So. Right. And so for me, like making sure everything was in order, um, preparing for the worst, to make sure that my family, you know, is taken care of. Like I've got, you know, things like money and weird places and weird investments that like people are not going to necessarily recognize, like making sure that all of this stuff is kind of taken care of. Uh, and in so order. taking care of the, that stuff, like uh, the will or whatever it is as well. Right. Right. And so in some ways I'm, I'm sure people would view that and my family might view that as being, you know, it's easy to view that as, I think, being negative, that you're kind of looking at the worst. But for me, it was like, this is being realistic. Like, I have no mm -hmm. control over these things. Like, I'm going to try my best while unconscious to wake up. Like, um, you know, mm -hmm. this is not something that in the slightest do I want to happen, but also it's real. Like, so, yeah, it, it was a very hard time of, and also they ended up delaying the surgery an additional week. And, and there was just a lot of weird mental gymnastics kind of involved with, yeah. well, I want to have this done ASAP, but also it feels weird to want this thing that is the highest risk of me dying that I've had in my life to be happening sooner. And right. that was just a very weird, again, these mental hurdles that kind of get created as a result of that, where <laughs> you just don't Let, really... Let's just have a coin flip for my life ASAP, right? And it's like, and yeah. Of course, it's a very, very weighted coin. Yeah, but uh, sorry, also, I don't mean I don't mean yeah, 50 50, but you know what I'm course. saying. Yeah, yeah. it's just it, it was there were so many things that were so weird, especially having not gone through 
anything really similar. Um, so very, very challenging. Mm. Did you find it hard to, you sort of implied this, but did you find it hard for your family or those around you to, to feel what you were feeling? Cause I feel like your mind might be thinking about risk and life differently from those who are even close to you are thinking about it. So was that, was that also a challenge? The hard, I don't want to say the hardest part because there's so many hard parts, but one of the hardest parts of all of this, I don't know if I want to call it guilt, but it's very, if it's not guilt, it's guilt adjacent of putting my wife and my mother and other people in this type of situation of even if this, and, and it's hard to know because the doctors were like, listen, obviously having heart issues when you're overweight your whole life, more likely to happen. But stuff like this, it's just as likely, if not more likely to be caused by genetics. And so in all actuality, it's probably some combination, but there's no way to really know for sure. But either way, like this was something that is happening in my life that was greatly, like greatly impacting the people closest to me in a very negative way. And almost all of that, no, 99.99999% of that is just because they care about me. And seeing me go through this is so hard for the people who care the most about me. But it's also putting extra burden on other people, extra responsibilities. That's really hard for me. Like my whole life, especially coming from very much the gambling world, I've been very, very big on not having debts to never owe people anything. And that really goes down to as far as favors for the most part. Like I like to be the one ahead. I like to do things for other people. And most of the reason why is because I don't want that negative feeling. And I've seen plenty of other people who are in that position of indebted to others and how hard that can be. And that, that's something that I've always very much avoided very consciously. And so, um, you know, being in this position of, I can't take care of myself right now. Like I am adding a lot of extra stress and, you know, I mean, my, my mom is a teacher 3000 miles away and taking off from school and, you know, taking care of me. Like, this is a real ask. It, it costs money to fly across the country. It costs time. You're, completely interrupting your life and you're adding a ton of stress like that is hard and then my wife even more so like she's got a big job she's taking care of the dog she's now taking care of me she's taking care of the household and it's just it's so many things where i mean life is already so hard when it's kind of going well you know reasonably well it's hard and so when things get tough it, it's just it's just a lot to ask and you know then you start factoring in lack of sleep and me not being able to sleep well, which is causing her to not be able to sleep as well. And you need to make sure that, you know, the things I have to deal with in the middle of the night that she's able to help me, like everything is just, it's a lot. It's just a whole lot. And it feels bad. Like it feels great knowing that people are willing to do that for me, but it feels terrible knowing I'm putting them in that situation. So it's just, it's just a very hard thing. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, um, guilt adjacent and is this the most you think you've asked of your family ever? I think so. I mean, I, I can't really answer that, especially when you're talking about like my mom, who has been an amazing mom for, you know, I'm 39 years yeah, old. It's a long time. Cumulative, right. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, is this more work than giving birth? <laughs> like, are we really, <laughs> are we going to compare these things? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how hard it is to raise a child as someone who hasn't raised a child. I imagine it's extremely challenging. Yeah. Um, you know, and my wife in a lot of ways had a very tough childhood and has been through a lot of different things in her life. So um, it's hard to know how hard this is on other people like they because they might give a very different answer than I would give. Do, it sure. feels like the most I've put on other people, because, again, I've been very self-sufficient in a lot of ways. Like I was very well off before I met my wife. Like I didn't. So like when it comes to like taking care of me and a lot of these other things, like I, I've been always able to give back at least as much as I was taking in, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. And of course, there would be plenty of situations where that's not the case and she's doing way more than I'm doing or, you know, there's been mm -hmm. more situations I could ever count of my mom or my extended family and my dad. Um, 
being able to do, you know, just a ton for me. Like my dad, when I got into magic, um, the first pro tour I actually decided to play was in London. I was 15. So my dad came with me and he came with me to all the pro tours for the next three years while I was in high school. Like, you know, he That's was lot, the person yeah. who didn't know how to coach sports, but coached every little league team and basketball team that I played on. He just volunteered. He was going to be there anyway. And so, you know, that's kind of the type of parents that I had, which, you know, I, I think that they would say that this was just a, I don't know if they'd say this was a great part of parenting or something. They were just totally happy to do, but I think they were totally happy to do it. Like, I think it's a lot of what made, you know, whenever you ask my parents what their greatest achievements are, accomplishments in life, like they'll both just say, having me and my brother, like these are, you know, we grown up into good people successful people like almost all of that kind of goes back to how we were raised um so yeah I, I think it, it's hard to kind of answer that because yes this feels like the most outward burden i've put on anyone in my life but also a lot of that it just kind of comes quid pro quo because like my wife has said if if the roles were reversed and when she's had medical issues in the past, like if, I would have done the exact same thing right. and it, it wouldn't have been, it'd been no questions asked. Like she has zero doubt in her mind. Like this is, yeah. you know, that's, guarantees. that's what commitment is. That's what right. being married is. Yeah. Right. And so her answer might be totally different. If like, Oh no, I was just being a wife like that. That's just normal. But for me as the person who is, you know, putting that on other people, it feels like because mm -hmm. I recognize it, it was definitely a lot, even if they might downplay it or it might not feel as much to them because it, it's just, again, being a mom and being a wife to them, I think. so. Mm. And what was the feeling, The the is it, I guess, is the day after or when you wake up and you realize that you're still alive, that you assume that it went well because you're still alive? Like, what, what's, what goes through your mind at that point? So the day of they kind of tell like i didn't realize this initially um but they told me as it got closer that you're basically not going to remember the day of which is good because i imagine it was i mean there there were complications there were a bunch of different issues that they were trying to deal with not necessarily the most serious but you know stuff that just involved like heart rate or blood pressure or these other things that can very quickly turn into serious issues if not dealt with like obviously high blood pressure doesn't kill you but if you have high blood pressure while your heart's recovering and they're not able to control it those type of things can become very serious very quickly mm -hmm. um also you know i was cut open there was a breathing tube down my mouth and thinking about that especially knowing me i'm like oh if i wake up and realize this i'm gonna want to grab at it i'm gonna be gagging like, I, I don't yeah. deal with these type of things well that's the type of thing that i think would super freak me out i have no memory of this kind of stuff but i think my wife was in and mom were in the room for a little bit you know shortly afterwards and said it was tough to see me you know the shape that i was in at that point yeah. and the next day i mean everything just feels awful <laughs> like you're in so <laughs> much pain i mean you're on the heaviest painkillers and lots of stuff going on but like man it, you, you it's just like moving is so hard and like with this area being just mutilated basically just it, like, it hurts to breathe or what it just... yeah everything everything really like not breathing not i mean or it hurts to move i guess in any way right like you're on enough painkillers at that point for obvious reasons and that you've just had something super major going on but like if i wanted to adjust myself by just turning a little bit or like moving up or down in, in the hospital bed or, or anything like any movement that you make at all because your chest and core area are just so important to like movement and you know i had something on my arm i had something on my leg so it was just everywhere um you know, you know there's ivs in one arm there's in my neck and so it's just like trying to do anything was so painful that it's just like wow and then i i remember that for not the first night because well, i might have gotten them confused but, you know, I'm sitting, I'm laying in the hospital bed. It's nighttime gone. You know, my, my family has gone home and like, uh, there's like a clock right here and I'd fall asleep. I have someone who's never been able to sleep on my back in my life. I've never been able to sleep on planes. Um, and so now I'm trying to sleep in a hospital bed and there's, 
I would fall asleep and I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh God, please let, please tell me that was like a couple hours. So I really <laughs> please let rest. time have you last. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I'd look up and 45 seconds. I'm like, oh God. Like, <laughs> oh shit. But I kept like, I would pass out again, like over and over. And this happened all night. And the longest I think I, I don't think I ever got to two minutes of, okay. of sleep. And this just must like, be what hell on earth feels like. Yeah. Right. And it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> you're just like holy hell like because also again as someone who's never been able to sleep in that position like is it always going to be like this like what is going on mm -hmm. um and yeah so that that was also a big part of what made a lot of recovery for a while really hard is that obviously the sleeping got better and easier but mm -hmm. it, never, it didn't really get great and so you know even like a week or two weeks afterwards well still just in a lot of pain it's just like i am so tired and like i have not slept well in you know a very long time and so that that just kind of made you know people would ask how you're feeling or how you're doing and you're just like you know in that super groggy state of like even ignoring all the pain you're just like i don't know like everything just feels <laughs> weird it's, it's one hard. of those things where it's like it's so hard to explain to people i know people are, are always I, i've been there too it's like people are have are well-intentioned they just want to they want to look out for you. They want to ask how you're doing, but it's like, you can't really, how can they really know, right? How can, how can anyone really know unless they're literally you at that point in time? And it's also hard because, you know, they'd ask how you're doing and they, they probably specifically mean like around your heart or the areas that are like, they can very, I mean, it's also super obvious with a lot of this stuff. Like it's not very well hidden that you have this giant scar like on your, yeah. and so, um, and you're like, well, you know, this stuff's not so bad, but also I feel like I'm going to die because I haven't slept in two weeks. So I don't really have a good answer for you. Like, I can't think straight. Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, it was just a it was hard. But also it was crazy in that you could see like it's so weird right now that it, it's been six weeks. And you think about what it was like one week ago and two weeks and in each week, week to week and how different it is. And how dramatically, di like, six weeks is not that long. Like, I mean, r full recovery is generally two to three months. But, like, to think of where I was at three weeks ago, and just, it's just so easy to then be so grateful. And then you think about all the things that people have done for you. It's just so easy to be so grateful. And, you know, there, there are so many things that are just like, uh, you know, you, you feel lucky. But, I mean, you feel unlucky that you had to be put in the spot, but also just like, as far as it's concerned, once you're in that spot, like, you know, everything went great. Like just a very lucky thing. That, that, that's so, that's so relatable. Like I just, I've just been through so many things in life as well. I've had surgery, I've had different things, uh, major surgeries as well. And it's, it's just amazing. Like, I think it's part of human nature is that human nature makes it easy to take things for granted and just kind of fast forward into the future like you know i i was going like we all go through stuff but and it's maybe i'm an outlier because i don't know if you're the same way too but i have a very long memory so it's like i'll remember things i'll remember when someone like um you know when someone wronged me like two years ago or i'll remember uh what it felt like recovering from that surgery but i think most people don't really i feel like that's actually not a gift that's actually it's actually not a good thing because I, th I think human nature or life requires us to kind of selectively quickly forget the things you know what i mean like yeah that, that also makes it hard to remember the good stuff too but i i think i think it's almost a curse like remembering things at such a d graphic detail like the good and the bad at least in my experience so yeah i've had a lot a lot of similar feelings i mean my my memory growing up was as good as anyone I've ever seen. Um, and that took a, a real sharp decline. I don't know exactly when, but probably right around the time I turned 30, it started taking a, a pretty sharp decline from where it was at. It's still decent, but it used to be, I could remember every turn of every game I've played for years in Magic. I could remember exactly how many chips everyone bet on, on all of the hands that at least mattered in poker remember all the cards and all the packs and drafts of magic and i used to actually in college go to classes sleep through them and retain all the information 
don't really know how. Uh, obviously, it was never like if someone just asked me a question, I have no idea. But then, I, you know, I'd get a test with multiple choice or whatnot. And the answer was just there for all the like, again, I don't really know how a lot of this stuff worked. It was just not obviously something that I did to allow this to happen. It's but, just in you, right? You just right. have that. And yeah. And my memory is not great anymore. Um, I think I'd probably describe it as fine. But yeah, as I got older, it's just gotten worse. But I've definitely, the emotional things are definitely still there, good and bad of, you know, people who have really gone out of their way to, you know, do positive things and people who have really contributed to my life negatively. And I, I agree. I would definitely call it more of a curse, especially because I would love to be able to get past a lot of the, you know, I've had a lot of close friendships where the people turned out to just not be good people. And it shouldn't really impact me much anymore. In a lot of ways, it doesn't, but it, it, there's still something there. And so, and, and for me, that's more frustrating than anything else because they're not a part of my life and I shouldn't really care at all. Um, and it's not like I'm, I'm not wishing anything negative or ill towards any of these people, even if they are bad people. But also I'm not, I don't want to see like really good things happen to them either. And so it's like, it's, and, and the reality is I just shouldn't care at all. And that, that's what I would prefer. But yeah, it's hard. It's, it's hard for me because I, I think uh, my wife tells me this sometimes, like, why do you care so much about this? Like, why do you care about my wife's uh, the exact you know, same way as me. So. Like, why do you care about like hosting your friend who you've never seen in five years and they, they're now visiting your city? Uh, we're in China, but like now they're visiting China. Like, why do you have, why do you feel like you have to show them around? Like, it's not like she wants to be, be a bad friend, but it's just, it's just sometimes I go out of my way to do things and it doesn't, it's just not in her, in her value system, I guess. Maybe I'm saying this in a way that makes it sound, uh, negatively about my wife but it's that's not what i intend it's just it's just i i have a certain feel i have certain feelings about loyalty and like yeah. long-term friendships that i don't necessarily need to have and sometimes because i'm i'm a bit i'm an overthinker like sometimes mm -hmm. i just ask myself like james why are you doing this stuff it's like <laughs> <laughs> is that is that really productive I, I i don't know and so that's why i say it's it, these kind of things can be sometimes more counterproductive than not so yeah, I mean, I think that it's kind of left to each person. I think it's a good thing to kind of reflect on, like you just said, though, when you think about it and go like, hey, is this productive? The answer might be yes. It probably is yes. Like, um, especially when it comes to those type of things with when it comes to loyalty, because um, my wife's the exact same way as me as far as like, I don't want to say grudges necessarily, but like, you know, it's the same thing. People do good things for you. People do bad things to you. And that stuff definitely lingers with her more. She's definitely also can be kind of judgmental in that kind of way of like, hey, well, you know, these actions are really positive. These actions are really negative. Like, why are people this way? You know, she's had a, a different upbringing than I have. And everyone's had a different upbringing. And so I think a lot of this stuff is kind of shaped by that. And she's very similar to what you just described when it comes to loyalty and things like that, especially when it comes to family. And a lot of times her family doesn't necessarily deserve the same loyalty or sometimes they do and, and it's just very hard to especially someone who didn't grow up in the same situation to kind of have input because at the end of the day that's her decision to make like does she need to go out of her way to do something to take care of her mom who would not necessarily do the same thing for her it's like i can't decide that like if you feel mm -hmm. responsibility for that um by all means that is an option I will tell you that you probably shouldn't feel responsibility for that because of this reason, because it would not be reciprocated. And because the reality is you don't actually owe that. Like this is not, in my opinion, how loyalty works. Loyalty works more in the way of, hey, I I'm happy to do this thing for to help you out because you're a good person or you do the same for me. Or there's a myriad of reasons, but not just because, oh, you know, you, you, we are related in loyalty some way. Loyalty versus or, obligation, maybe. Yeah, loyalty yeah. versus obligation. That's exactly right. And so, um, yeah. but also, you know, that's a choice to make. Like, if, if you're going to choose to not do this and then you're going to feel bad about it for years, 
well, it was probably better to just do it. Like, you'll probably still feel bad that you chose to do it in some mm -hmm. capacity because mm -hmm. you've taken something out of your life. But that's kind of a trade off you have to make. You know, if you're in that lose lose situation personally, it's just a, a totally personal decision. Yeah. There's also that thing about regret minimization, which is regardless yeah. of why, I think sometimes just operating on the maximum of minimizing regret. That's, yeah, especially in those that's, lose, that's lose situations. You got to. I mean, again, which makes it so hard to have input as someone who's not living the same life in the same body with the same brain and the same experiences. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know which one you're going to regret less. I don't know whether, you know, this actually is something that's loyal to your obligation in some situations, but my impression is this, that, and the other. So it's kind of the best I can do. So I know that this is not, this is a real life. This is not a, a movie or a dramatic arc, but is there something about Eric Froelich that changed like before and after the, this major surgery, like, especially now that you have a little bit of a couple of weeks to, to maybe reflect and, and look back on it. Hard to answer again, because in a lot of ways, I'm still in the middle of it. It's also a lot of things kind of blend together. Like when you're talking about now in recovery versus when it happened versus the lead up to it once I found out it was going to happen versus, you know, just the getting healthier in general because it was of more importance versus, you know, like all of these different things in a lot of ways kind of blend together because they have a similar mindset of like wanting to preserve longevity, wanting to be there for your family, wanting to start a family of your own, responsibility. Um, both to yourself and to the people who care about you um, to be healthy. And now that I'm in a position where my life expectancy should be much higher in theory, I mean, stuff happens. So, you know, that obviously I could pass away today. You know, I could pass away tomorrow. There's just stuff that happens that, you know, is completely out of anyone's control, but my expectancy is much higher. And so that puts me in a good position. It makes it easier to plan out things like having a family. It relieves a lot of burden now from my wife who would have to worry about life expectancy being less, trying to start a family. You know, when your husband has a shorter life expectancy is a really hard thing to do. I think part of the reason why we've postponed some of the family thing is health related. And then if I'm not around, can my wife actually support her, herself and children without me around? Like if she, you know, when I met her, she didn't have a job, you know, while we were dating for a while and getting married, she had, you know, worked at things like geek squad and some other like kind of retail stuff. But, and then she did contract work with stuff like the super leagues um, with magic, but these are not careers. And so it's a lot of extra stress if you're going to be on your own. And that that's that just creates a lot of, you know, mental burdens and everything, again, involving stress to try to figure out what is the best decision. And she's also younger, like she's 30, I'm 39. Um, so it's not like, you know, especially five, six years ago, not super pressing as a, you know, 24, 25 year old to have a family right away when there's still a lot of things to kind of figure out and a lot of things that make that even scarier than just how it is just because that's a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so it feels good in that regard of knowing I've, I should be in a better spot, you know, from the end of last year to now I'm down 50 pounds. Like I have, I'm going in the right direction for a lot of things and a lot of, um, a lot of stuff involving my health is just kind of on the right track and either improved somewhat or improved greatly. And so all those things are good. It, but again, it's hard to know, like, when did that change as opposed to, this is something I've cared about in some capacity for a long time. I've been trying to lose weight for decades, like, but it, it's also hard to know, like how much effort and how much, I guess just sticking with effort, I, I really put into that. Because for me, a lot of the time, it feels like it was a lot of effort, you know, like 
I was counting calories. I was eating the right foods with the nutritionist. I was at, you know, had a personal trainer. I was in the gym three or four times a week for, you know, an hour plus with trainers and, and on my own. And, um, but it's hard to say, like, was that enough? Like, I also stopped after maybe a year in some cases, maybe after six months, like, um, so it's hard to know, like, was I actually taking it seriously or, I mean, I think a lot of this stuff, again, kind of boiled down to more aesthetics and being single, growing up overweight, like a lot of stuff was just very hard about that. And so whether I actually had the right mindset or whether I was actually focusing on health versus other things, I don't really know. Um, so it's hard to know how much has changed because I've changed so much as a person from 21 to 25 to 30 to now 39. Um, and I, but I think I, I'm just continually going in, in better and better directions. So it's always hard to say because, um, uh, I, I think, um, what's that joke? Like, um, paraphrasing, but the, the 60 year old janitor knows more than the like 20 year old Harvard graduate who's highly educated and seems to know everything about life or appears to, it's just, there's just no substitute for lived experience. And sometimes lived experience just supersedes everything. It's not like, like there's no narrative of, uh, this happened to me, therefore it woke me up or something like that's just some sort of, uh, a lot of these things can be constructs, right? I don't, I don't think, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg intended to, um, connect the world in Africa when he started Facebook. Like there's a lot of like post revisionism that, uh, we also have for ourselves and to, to keep ourselves functional. Right. I guess this is the cynical side of me coming out, but like, it's, it's really hard to figure out like. I, I'm here now because of exactly 15% this and 35% that and 50% that, you know, so. Yeah. And for me, like, I struggle with a lot of different things involving mindset um, and like, Facebook and Twitter, social media, really. It was just weird kind of, um, you know, because a lot of that stuff started to pick up like right after I was in college and then kind of. 2021 i've always been very quiet to myself more than anything else had a lot of success in a lot of different games from a young age um poker you know i, I won my first world series of poker bracelet at 21 and there was you were the youngest bracelet winner at that time right yeah i was the youngest to win and it got put on espn and so there were a bunch of big poker forums and I'd never used forums like forums. I don't know how long they had really been a big thing prior to that. This was 2005. Now I, mm. I'm, I'm sure they existed because obviously they don't involve a ton of technology or anything, but um, I'd never really used the poker forums and some friends and other people would kind of link me to these things of people just saying awful stuff about me about, I mean, a lot of it came down to making fun of my appearance and that I don't deserve the success that I have, especially I was young. And, you know, of course, that means you're unknown in this poker world. You know, you've got a handful of, you know, the superstar poker players and you have, now you have this 21 year old winning, yeah. you know, a pretty big tournament. on. But ESPN. people will just make up shit about you on the Internet. That's just weird. Yes, that is also <laughs> very. Yeah, that was a big part of my uh getting into the magic hall of fame was my wife's asking me if all of these things, stories that people would make up about me on the internet are any of these true. It's just like, this is, this couldn't be less true. Like <laughs> this doesn't even make sense. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, you know, seeing these things of people saying all of this shit about me, no one I've ever met, of course, because no one had met me. Like I had only been on the poker scene for a couple months at the time. I just turned 21. Um, yeah, so as Twitter and, and social media started to pick up more, I used it as a total, like, brick wall defense mechanism. And... What what do I, you mean by that, exactly? I would more use it to kind of push people away than anything else. Like, there was a lot of complaining. There was a lot of, like, bad beat stories or... You know, you play a match of magic as one of the best players in the world. Lose because you got unlucky, which is generally going to be how you lose when you're one of the best players in the world at a game. 
But that's just part of the game. And I recognize that's part of the game. I understand that the best players of all time are winning 60-ish percent of the time in Pro Tours. Like, you lose a ton of games because there's a lot of variance involved. The same thing in, in poker. It's what we signed up for, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I more than recognize that. Now, am I, was I upset when I lost? Like, I was upset when I lost. And was I upset about it five minutes after the fact? No, I was fine because it's one of those things that's like in the moment, you're just like, you know, upset that you lost, but also it's reality and it you lose all the time and whatever. It's not like it's this thing that's just haunting me that I, I mean, I'm going to think about, you know, the next day or even hours later, it just, it dissipates very quickly. But then I think there was part of me that felt like because you're losing to, I mean, in reality, in your head, you're like inferior competition. If you think that, you know, you're really great at something and you're just explaining the reason why, like, oh, Mulligan to five, like, lost a good matchup. Like, yeah, that's complaining. No one cares. But also you're in in your head. It's a kind of internal commentary that that comes out, right? Yeah. But, I mean, I think a lot of it just came down to, one, wanting to push people away because I didn't want to let anyone in. And I think the people closest to me kind of recognized, like, your personality online versus your personality in real life are just, like, worlds apart. Mm -hmm. and because the people i didn't know like the unknowns were the people who were saying these horrible things about me on these forums who've never met me it's just like f you all like i don't care and also you should know that i'm you know now they're gonna because the next thing that would happen was people would then make fun of you for doing poorly because now you've won this event and then you do poorly in the next one as is normal but now they're like oh see you really does suck like this person's awful like i had I did badly on one of the weeks of Magic Pro League, and one guy made 72 videos about how I must be cheating because how else could I lose this much on a week of Magic Pro League? And it's just like, this is really how, like, I'm saying this is really how some people think. I don't know if it's real or not, but I, I imagine some percentage of people really do think that way. And so going like, yeah, you know, no one could have won in these situations. Like, this is what happened is complaining that no one cares about makes you look bad but also i was happy pushing people away so i didn't care about that and right. it was like yeah here's why i lost what would you have done like you know screw you kind of thing <laughs> and so it's, i think that really uh, hurt it's a classic me a lot damned if you do thinking. damned if you don't right if you win uh they'll make up something the about you no that it's not because nobody cares and yeah. the people who do that you like the problem is that i am now doing this First off, I've set up a negative impression of myself, which at the time meant nothing to me. And I never cared about being in the public at all and also didn't care if people had a negative impression of me. But as you get older, you start realizing that, like, you know, you, you potentially cost yourself a lot of friendships and relationships with people who are you just are never going to get to meet because you've put up this barrier of, like, why am I why would I approach this person? And I think that's even more I, I've kind of proven that to be more true as a lot of people who are in like the, the pro magic scene or in the pro poker scene who I had never talked to previously. Cause I think they probably thought I was a jerk and like, why would you, I wouldn't want to approach someone like that and, and just try to get to know them. Like that wouldn't, there's nothing enticing about that. And so, you know, I, I think that the reality is that I am a good person and that I'm a valuable person for a lot of people to have in their lives that I, provide good conversation i'm intellectual i'm funny like and you know i think that i um enrich my friends lives and in, in real ways and hopefully meaningful ways or at least i try to i think i'm a good friend but um yeah I, I wasn't really opening myself up to having more relationships or for people to want to get to know me so i had my close group of friends and for me i was happy with that and Obviously, this didn't impact them at all because they knew the real me, but also it has negative impacts. And it, and it may have actually negatively impacted more because, you know, if other people wanted to kind of join that same circle or if they start to branch out and make friends with more people, those people might not want to be friends with me because all the things they know about me are now this negative impression that I have now I've actively chosen to put out into the world. Like no mm -hmm. one made me do any of these things. <clears throat> So then it had just like a bunch of different consequences, a lot of them probably unseen, but also, like I was just saying, people would make up stories about me 
for things like when Hall of Fame voting was happening. And I didn't really feel like I should say anything. Like, I shouldn't refute this. I shouldn't get involved. And a lot of the reason behind that became, like, I recognized the fact that a lot of this is my fault. And what I mean by that is that if someone made up these exact same stories about someone like Reed Duke, no one, no one would believe it. Like, no one would have to come to their defense and be like, hey, this isn't true. He wouldn't have to go like, hey, you know, this story is totally made up because it would be unbelievable. And the fact that I have now put myself in a position where I have made it believable that I could do these things or that I could be this person that is just mean to people, I felt like that was my fault. And so... So that made it hard to push back against even things that are not true, because in some ways you, I, I can understand where your mind is going. Like you feel indirectly, like that is a credible claim based on the way that you've crafted your online persona, even though that's not your real persona. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's pretty close. I mean, I, I felt like I could refute it. I felt like I shouldn't or that it wasn't. Or it would be that. counterproductive, like you could refute it, but those haters are going to hate anyway. So, and your friends right. know who you are. So what does right. it matter? Right. Like one of the most outlandish stories came, someone said that walking up to the table at a Grand Prix, I told the people sitting on both sides of me to move their play mats because I needed more room than everyone else because I was the only one who was going to go deep in this tournament. I've never said anything to anyone at Grand Prix. I don't talk. Like, I'm a quiet person. And I've certainly never said something that, like, that is absurd. So a complete fabrication. Of, yeah, of not that, based yeah. in any reality, like, total opposite of anything that I would ever do in my life. But people believed it. And it's just like, well, okay, well, I, I've now put myself in this position. Because if you said that Reed Duke did this, people go, like, you're full of shit. Like, no fucking that, way. that did not happen. <laughs> like, there yeah. was no chance. And I felt like that I have to kind of take some personal accountability for like allowing these things to be, I mean, that is pretty unbelievable for kind of anyone, but like also the fact that I, there's I push some back shit. on that though, there, things are either true or false. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, for things like this, it's, it's very but black me and saying white. that's false. That didn't happen. Literally nothing like that has ever happened. Nothing similar to that has ever happened or ever would happen. Uh... What is that really adding? Like, you know, <laughs> Someone's going to go like, I believe it happened or like, that makes sense. And like, mm -hmm. those are the type of responses on, on a, this Reddit post. And it like, devolves into he said, she said, which right. you can never I get mean, out of. Again, yeah. and, and these aren't, the people who are saying these things are not like the fact that they think poorly of me, I, I feel bad about that. Like I do, but also I very much come from the belief of if there's someone that you wouldn't take advice from. I'm not necessarily going to care as much about their criticism. Like if, I, if right. I'm not looking to you for advice, ways. how much am I yeah. going to care about what negative things you have to say? Like right. constructive criticism is great. For, I, I think I chose the wrong word on that. So I'm, I'm not trying to say that um, people can't give you, you know, more, but again, that kind of goes closer to it. You're not saying so, people can't give you feedback, but it should right. be constructive feedback or criticism. Right. Right. So, yeah, I, I mean, mm. I don't know. It's just kind of a tough spot. What exactly is, in your mind, the, I guess this is kind of a poker concept, right? The image that you cultivated, like, is it that of being unsportsmanlike or is it something else? Um, that's a tough question. I hope not. I really hope not. Like, I shake people's hands when they beat me. I say good game, but also... So one of the big things that got me to totally stop doing this was I got a response from Patrick Sullivan, who I think most people know from Star City Commentary. And he put it in a way that I hadn't really thought about that. When, so like if I tweet about the reasons why I lost a game due to mulliganing to four, my opponent top decking their one out or whatever it is, totally factual, totally factual. But it's taking something away from the win that someone else had, which is almost in a lot of ways the intent of giving reasoning behind my loss. But I never thought about it 
fully from the other perspective of this might be someone else's like career highlight. Like they just beat a Hall of Famer in a big match of magic. And to do anything that might be taking away from that is messed up and not something I would ever want to do. And I had never really thought about it from that actual perspective of there was another person in this match. Yes, they got lucky to beat you. You were a better player than them. Whatever. You had a good matchup. Whatever the case may be, who cares? Because no, that's the other thing is no one cares. No one cares why you lost. You know, in reality, no one does. And so to potentially be negatively impacting some, you know, another person who might have a real high, have a real sense of accomplishment, how, you know, this, this might really matter to them. And the fact that my comment or my tweet that it was a throwaway tweet for me as like a vent for 30 seconds until I wasn't frustrated a minute later, like the fact that that could then have a, a real negative impact on someone else made me feel awful. And I'm like, the, the, I, I, I just can't do this again. Like, that's not, that's not okay. I, I don't, I would never want that for anyone that, you know, I wouldn't want that for myself. I wouldn't want that for anyone that, you know, I've ever known that just, that stinks. And so, mm. you know, getting a new perspective on, without, and it, it's, it makes me feel bad that I didn't really figure that out on my own quicker. Um, but I'm glad that I was able to figure out at some point, you know, this was you know, seven, eight years ago now at this point. Um, what was it exactly that made Patrick reach out to you? Was it just because you fired off a tweet like that or were, what were the I circumstances? Asked. I think I asked. I think I actually made a Facebook post about, I, I can't remember. Like I, I, I legitimately can't remember, but I think it was more like, what is the best way to handle these type of situations where you're blah, 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 you're feeling this way or, you know, I, I don't think it was actually a response to a tweet where he's going, he said, don't do this. I think I specifically asked for advice on something like Facebook. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. my memory's again, kind of hazy of it, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that's what happened. And he gave a response and I told him like, that is really helpful. <laughs> like, you know, I, I really didn't think about it that way. I wish I had, I, I have a lot, like, I think it was, I think I was in a, state of kind of like self-reflection of like, man, this, this, I need to figure out what is kind of going on with me, why I feel the need to do this, what, you know, what needs to change, especially because it got to the point where, you know, I'd be in the middle of my, you know, mulligan to five, mulligan to four, whatever it is, discard to missing a land drop. And it's already like going, running through my head instead of trying to figure out the best way to win. Like, I know that Reed Duke is figuring out the best way to win this game, despite the fact that he's only one or 2% to win it. And my mm. head was half filled with what am I going to, like, what's the tweet going to be? <laughs> and again, okay. like, how much is it actually costing you? probably not much of anything you're you're almost never winning this game and you know if you start to come back to, and i have won games from that position too where I, I know where um you know it's already started to kind of run through my head and then i've come back to win but mm -hmm. i'm like this this it just doesn't, doesn't make it fun anymore and again i know it's not adding anything like people like tweeting bad beats in anything just makes people think like you're kind of a sore loser or you're you know not all there mentally like there's a bunch it's all negative emotions that people feel about you when you're doing these type of things mm -hmm. and it's not really a position that you want to actively be choosing to be in like i understand that every now and then maybe but like the fact that it's kind of a regular occurrence just it felt childish i guess more than anything else and you know as someone who's like 30 at that point i'm like there's a reason why none of the other best players in the world are doing this why are we like there's no reason to figure this out but now that you have a little bit of years have gone by like are you able to objectively look back at yourself and answer the question like why did you have these type of responses i want to say that i am completely i have completely been uh affected by tilt emotional lack lack of emotional control like i i have not played magic or poker at the same stakes as you but I think it's very natural. I'm a, I'm a spike by nature. So I want to play every match of whatever to win. And the feelings of entitlement have come across 
my mind. It's like when I feel like I prepared more than my opponent, I felt like they got lucky. I felt like I got unlucky. Um, I am similar to your age. Like I am 41 years old. And when I play magic today, I don't want to say I'm an angel. I still have those feelings. It's just the game does that to us, uh, to, to many of us. Um, but I, but that's me, right? I'm just, this is me blabbing about myself, but looking back on your behavior or your thoughts, like, what is it? What is it like a need for, is it entitlement? Is it a need for control? Is it something more complicated than that? So my best answer is that growing up, growing up is the wrong term again, I guess, because um, this all started when I was probably in my 20s, but a lot of stuff was like life was very hard. Um, I think I struggled with, again, like depression adjacent type things. And I was lonely. Um, and so I think that, oh, not I think, I know that a lot of these magic tournaments and poker tournaments were an escape. And while I was playing on them and competing and had a chance to win, there was all sorts of different possibilities that um, there were just these positive outcomes and, and this way to you kind of fantasize, I guess, about what might be. And each loss in magic kind of made that dream a little bit more shattered each bad beat in poker a little bit more shattered and then you'd get knocked out and it would just kind of be like the balloon burst and you know now i've got maybe a long flight back home like you know maybe i'm in spain maybe i'm in japan for a magic tournament and i've got to fly back to the us and then i don't have another one coming up for months and so we're just going to be kind of trapped in the monotony of everyday life of dealing with the same emotions that we're dealing with beforehand without that sense of hope or the same light at the end of the tunnel that you might have had while you were in the event. And so it really just was that kind of fall from grace or whatever you want to call it. Again, the balloon bursting type emotion of just like, well, shit, like, here we are not going to win this thing. And now you have to deal with life. And so that was a lot of it. Like, so the losses hurt, like it hurt to kind of recognize that, you know, we're going back to the same old and how hard it was. And then as the event would start to, you know, we'd get closer to the event and start preparing for the event and like hey, all the hopium would start to build again and it would just be kind of the same deflating process until the, the bubble burst. And it was just hard because, it, it, again, it, it was just kind of a steep fall. Like when you're out, you're out until then you have this hope. And um, once you start to figure out more things about life and you kind of get a lot of that stuff in order, you get your house in order, you get to figure out, you know, having because I don't want to give the impression I ever had a, a not happy home life. Like my, again, my family is incredible. I had a great home life in that regard, but being out kind of more on my own or figuring out life or, um, and I didn't even live alone very often, but a lot of stuff just still felt very isolating. I've always been very bad at making connections. I think that's probably a pretty common thing for a lot of adult males in a lot of ways, but making friends and, um, I struggled a lot. Again, I had a lot of close friends that turned out to not be good people, which kept, again, feeling like bubble bursting and also made it harder to then want to try again. And that's um, on them. But ultimately, there's a kind of disappointment that that it carries both, on though, to you. Because I... as someone like especially with the line of work or you know things that I've done, a lot of it really comes down to judging people and being a good judge of character it is a, right. a large part of you know, it, it's a lot of figuring out people and a lot of psychology. And so becoming close friends with someone who turns out to not to legitimately not be a good person also makes me or at least made me feel, you know, I don't want to say gullible, that about maybe myself. or like almost like gullible almost. Or... 
I don't know. Maybe that I just wasn't as good at the things I thought I was good at. You know, maybe I wasn't as talented at reading people and these different psychological aspects as I thought I was, which just kind of felt disappointing, coupled with like the pain of, you know, losing friendships or losing relationships yeah. or these type. Of, it was. It's just. I mean, again, this just comes out to life is hard everyone has these experiences. And so it's not like, oh, I'm unique and I had to deal with all, because in actuality, my life is probably dramatically easier than a massive percentage of the world. Again, I grew up a white cis male, upper middle class with not a lot mm. of problems. <laughs> and so it's just, but I also kind of recognize that the easiest lives are still hard. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not taking what you're saying in the wrong way at all. Like, it's also like, made me recognize the hard lives to, are crazy we, hard. I, I know, but I, 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 it's important to have empathy for others. And of course, yeah. like somebody objectively, someone in Africa is having a worse life than either of us right now. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't take away from the fact that in our own headspace, at any point in time, we have our own struggles and we all have to yeah. deal with it. So it's not like this is just my belief, but like just saying that someone has it harder than me doesn't doesn't take away like my struggle, right? Like I still have yeah. to live my life, have to deal with it. Yeah. And it's actually, it's funny because I've had a lot of people in my life, my mom included, who, you know, I, I would lose in a tournament. She's like, oh, but you did so much better than all these other people. Or, yeah, you know, it's think not about so how much better these things are. Yeah. Than other people have it. And it was like, my mom's the same way. So I don't know if I want to call it pet peeve or just the thing that kind of drove me off the wall. It's like the one thing I'm like, we need to end this conversation. I, I'm just going to go like, we're done. <laughs> like, this is, it's not, I helpful. get it. Yeah. Someone else <laughs> having it worse off than me does not help me in the slightest. It just makes me feel worse. <laughs> like, yeah. No, thanks. I mean, I get it. Like I understand I'm extremely privileged, but also, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. it was really that it was like magic was like the, or magic or poker, or like some type of intellectual pursuit, competitive pursuit was the thing that kept you happy. It kept you engaged. And it was just very different from the rest of your life at that point. So when that bubble bursts any given weekend, it makes it feel all that much worse. That's what it sounds like. Well, to also, me. it's like, yes, completely. But also I'm dedicating my life and my time to this. Like this is, again, this is... Yeah, this is the thing I'm looking forward to. So it's like, oh, I've got this great thing coming up. But also, I've invested a lot of time and energy to become really good at this thing. And I, you know, I've invested a lot of money. And now, I'm, you know, it's just was so much of my life revolved around it that it just, yeah, it, it, it was everything. And um, right, yeah, bubble would burst and I'd just be like, all right, well, yeah, that happened. But what I find super interesting, Eric, is that despite all this, I mean, sure, we could look back and, see, you know, you, one could say, like, there's things maybe that could have been done differently, like socially, online, in person. But having said all that, you're still one of the greatest players to have ever played Magic the Gathering. So that to me sounds like, it seems like it, it almost... Of course, sample size of one, but almost to me, it feels like here's an example of someone who is Eric Froelich still made it and even ultimately still got elected into the Hall of Fame, which is honestly speaking, from my understanding, like a huge boys club of like people have to vote each other in. So like clearly you made it work despite the circumstances. So doesn't that say something good ultimate like if you believe the end justifies the means you're still one of the greatest players to ever play the game um there's no disputing that i feel like any everyone i've ever talked to before this interview they said eric's one of the best to ever play the game there's no like that's that's facts so would it be almost okay to say that the emotional part or the things that you could have done differently almost didn't matter no i don't think that would be fair because at the end of the day a lot of that just kind of boils down to I got lucky and I don't want to just say like I got lucky in games of magic. I think I got lucky in that. I didn't choose to, I, I mean, I think I'm objectively very intelligent and that's, you know, I went to the best high school. You probably have country. a high IQ, right? If you've ever tested. So. Yes. But I didn't do anything to earn that. That was something I was totally born into. And the reality is I don't think I've used 
the quote unquote gifts that I've been given particularly well. I've used them to do things that I enjoyed and that brought me joy um, in, in playing card game competitions. I don't necessarily regret that, but there are some things about that that, you know, it doesn't necessarily make you feel great because it's not necessarily contributing to society, especially poker, because a lot of poker comes from, you know, it, it's more Plastic of a zero sum. It's stuff. a zero yeah. sum. And it's, it's less than a zero sum because the house is taking some. So if you're going to win a lot, it means that other people are losing a lot. And so with that being said, in a lot of ways, I would prefer for people to, when they think about me with magic, and this will never be the case, of course, at this point, to be like, he was such a great person as opposed to such a great player. And, like, and I've done a lot of things, especially in the last like five to seven years since I've kind of since the Patrick thing, since other things kind of going on, since I've grown up, since I started, you know, a relationship with my now wife, um, there's been a lot of changes to me personally. And I, I've tried to give back a lot and I've done a lot to try to help underrepresented players in, in magic. And to, I've done a lot of just like freak, like I, I've done a lot of coaching. I've never charged anyone for coaching or that's not true. I, did once <laughs> before I started doing this, but I don't want to say never, but um, I, I've done a lot to try to give back in various ways that I thought would help the community and help the game and help, you know, I've, I volunteered for various things at Wizards to, again, try to help the game, try to help future generations of people like me. But most people, like, when you compare it to what a lot of other people have done or you start to again no no one's going to make that comment i mean maybe my wife would or maybe a couple of closest friends would that he was a great person in magic as opposed to a great player in magic and for me that's kind of tough because that i would have of course chosen that in my early 20s to be recognized as one of the best players to ever play the game and who cares like again i was the one who started the social media stuff because brick wall pushed people away who cares what their impression of you is now you know, that was at almost 20. Now that I'm almost 40, I don't feel that way anymore. And I feel the total opposite, where I'd much rather be recognized for all my contributions and, the, and these positive things that I kind of left on the game as opposed to like, oh, yeah, he cast his spells in the right order more often than almost anyone. It's just like, cool. Like, I'm glad that my brain was firing on all cylinders, oh, yeah, all cylinders a lot of times in my 20s and early 30s like great but you know um so when you said like can you say that that stuff almost doesn't matter i think very strongly the answer is no that that stuff matters a lot and that being a good person is worth a lot more than than being a good player i think that's just kind of everyone recognize like that's not, that's not saying anything profound or anything like everyone recognizes that in life i don't think necessarily again and I want to make it clear that that would not have been my position in my 20s. I would have 100% been like, yeah, being the best player is what sure. matters. You're in a different place mentally then. You would have been happy. You are. Right. You were happy with just that. Right. But now I have regrets for that stuff. Obviously, I could go back in time and, you know, never create a, you know, not create a Twitter until my 30s. Like those type <laughs> of things. Like I would, I would for sure sign up for that. But like mm -hmm. it is what it is at this point. Like obviously you can't change the past. Um, and so I. Here, here's the thing though right i know this is a this is what i'm going to ask you is impossibly flawed but you know how ceos or like certain people who are kind of well known like they kind of make their mark in their career doing things a certain way and then we kind of armchair quarterback and we say that don't do it like that anymore but what mm -hmm. got them there was doing it that way so it's very hard for anyone in any walk of life to just do a 180. have you ever thought about like not that there's a time machine to my knowledge, but wouldn't it be fair to also say that the way that you acted, the way you thought about it, the way you took things hard, that also contributed to your success results wise at that time. So it's almost like even, even if you had a time machine, you could go back as 40 year old Eric to 20 year old Eric, you could be a nicer person. You could, do things differently maybe if you had if you had the ability to do that in a fictional science fictional world but would you also not be able to achieve the results that you had had you done that 
It's a good question. Definitely something I thought about a lot in my early 30s. It honestly might have been almost the thing that I, you know, when we talked earlier and I said I posted on Facebook, I believe is where I got the advice from Patrick. It might have been very much that type of thing because I know I had a lot of internal and monologues and outer dialogues with other people about I would much rather be care a ton be really upset every time I lost than to not care at all not even close and so for me I felt like a lot of the stuff I was doing was again an air quotes okay or acceptable because caring a lot was important and i didn't want that to ever change i if i i felt like if i ever got to the point where i don't care a lot that's when i need to stop because if the loss doesn't hurt me this is probably not the right thing for me this means that i just don't care enough and i should find something else that might be true that might be false but you don't like that's the thing is that for my mindset, I felt like a lot of this was what people were projecting or what they were feeling. I don't know what they're feeling inside. Like, I don't know if the most polite players in the world when they lose are really upset they lost, but are just going to smile, shake hands and go about their lives because they're better adjusted in certain ways or they have different ways of maybe releasing that, that have, you know, maybe they go outside and, and scream once and they're fine. Or maybe, you know, they're able to compartmentalize it until afterwards. And, you know, they're not making anyone else necessary, you know, they're not risking anyone else potentially feeling bad because they've lost or they're upset or they're frustrated or they're not letting it impact anyone else and maybe not letting it impact themselves. Maybe they just, they don't care as much as me. I, for me, that's what I thought was probably the case. Looking back at it now, 10 years after the fact, you know, I, I have no idea if that was the case because now I, I know that when I lose or when I bust out of a poker tournament, I still care a lot. I'm not going to do the same thing as I used to do. And so clearly that's a possible thing. But um, clearly you can manifest it differently or outwardly, but you can still care a lot and you can still, uh, to excuse my French, you can still give a fuck about yeah. what happened, right? Yeah. And so as someone in their 20s, I think a lot of that didn't necessarily make a lot of sense or didn't really compute that, hey, other people could be going through something very similar to you, but they are just, I mean, obviously I'm using this version of a defense mechanism or, or a release of anger slash stress or whatever you want to call it, or whatever it is. Um, and they have a, a different one, but theirs is, might just be much better than mine. And so you know, for me at the time, I just kind of looked at it like, well, I care a lot. I don't want that to change. And, and honestly, you know, again, I don't have a great recollection of what exactly happened, but that feels like almost exactly the post that I probably would have made that w was what spurned all this is like, I care a lot. This is my way of handling this. I don't, obviously it's not the best way, but also I don't, if I ever stop caring about this thing to this extent, I don't really want to keep doing it. And that, that would have been kind of a perfect opportunity to go like, you can care a lot, but also you're putting your, you know, you're taking away from someone else when you do something like this potentially. And, you know, that, that, that I think that is very likely to have been, you know, almost exactly what the, the, what the post, however many eight years ago or wherever it was happened to be. You know that, you know what they said about, I think we all know what they said about Michael Jordan, right? He would create <laughs> slights about things just manufacture them to people fuel hated himself. michael jordan everyone who played against yeah him hated he him. punched steve kerr he he punched his teammate and he was incredibly unpleasant to to be around like mm -hmm. i guess the question here is is that how you thought about it when you were in your 20s like that this was a kind of just par for the course like this is how i fuel myself that's also hard to answer because again there aren't really great examples of this where people look back on them in a similar way that aren't Michael Jordan. Like the other people who are more like you hot survivorship bias or something, right? But yeah. But I think it's important because if John or Kai had been similar, you wouldn't look back on them in the same way that I think people would look back on me. Meaning that like some people might go like, oh well, they're the best. It makes more sense of why they're 
a certain way in the way that Michael Jordan was, where he wasn't just the best, he was the best by a lot. And John, you know, at one time was the best by a lot, and Kai at one time was the best by a lot. There might have been a time where I was the best, but odds are at all times I was kind of like the 10th best. And so if, if one through nine are not doing this and then 10 is, it's a bad look. Because, like, <laughs> we've already kind of proven that this is not needed to be the greatest of all time. Mm. And so I think I think it's a tough comparison because people don't look back on, like, Dennis Rodman or Ron Artest or, and in the same type of way that they look back on, on Michael Jordan. And so it's – I think it's just a tough comparison. Mm. That's fair. That's fair. Bill Lemire is not, you know, a revered player in, in the same way that, that – you can't get away with as much when you're not just like, well, he's goaded. Like, we get it. Yeah, they're not doing that deep dive into Luke Longley. He was actually <laughs> taken off the entire documentary until I watched this YouTube thing. Someone did like this entire thing on Luke Longley uh, documentary. They went to Australia. It was amazing. Like, and wow. it was like a it was like a retcon version of the Last Dance. It was it was pretty awesome. Anyway, very very random recommendation. For me, but <laughs> check that out if you haven't. <laughs> What does it take to be great at magic? I mean, a lot of what it takes to be great at magic is luck. Like, I've heard this plenty of times. I don't know how, like, nobody will ever know if it's true is part of the problem. But it's possible that the best player in the world, no one knows who they are. It's possible the best player in the world is a magic online grinder. That's actually somewhat likely at many different points throughout time. Um there's a, magic is an expensive hobby. It's very tough for a lot of people in a lot of areas of the world to be able to showcase their skills. Magic online definitely helps some, but it's not everything. Um, yeah, it's just tough because again, especially as someone who has a bunch of near misses, but just was afforded a lot of opportunities growing up in America in an upper middle-class family that could afford to buy cards and travel to events sometimes you get one shot and you're near missed because there's so much variance in magic was you know it's going to set you back a year it's going to set you back a lot like there just aren't as many at the time pro tour qualifiers or grand prix or just even just opportunities to be able to get to the highest level and so the fact that I was able to do that from a young age that the second ever Grand Prix is in my hometown when I'm 13 years old and I'm able to top eight that and kind of give myself the idea, like the confidence that, oh, I can maybe play this game professionally. I can, you know, again, I was a kid at the time, you know, I was 13 and I didn't actually, I skipped that pro tour and ended up not going to one until I was 15. But again, I was able to go to a pro tour in London at 15, like, I, I don't know how hard it is for people, you know, I know how hard it was for Paulo Vitor to be able to go to events, but uh, other people in Brazil just hearing about how hard it is to qualify because there's just less available pro tour qualifiers. There's less available Grand Prix travel anywhere is going to cost you a thousand plus dollars. Not necessarily as many people have the same type of money. I know that, like, you know, when he was winning a lot of, you know, he was winning a lot in magic. It wasn't actually a huge dollar sum, but the way that he would talk about it, make it sound like it goes a much further way. And I didn't have those same experiences and those same worries and that same, those same restrictions of actually getting there. So in a lot of ways, it requires that level of luck. And it just requires a lot of, I think, natural talent. I think magic is a game where you need to be able to have a brain that works in a certain way. And if you don't, it doesn't mean you can't win. It doesn't mean you can't be good. It doesn't mean you can't succeed, anything like that. But it makes everything so much harder. And my brain is very analytical, very mathematical, very much able to compartmentalize various things that are important and then hold numbers. My wife, who I met because she played Magic and she's done well at, you know, we've only gone to a handful of events together where she played like a few GPs and, and cashed in at least one of them, if not two of them, and got pro, like coming off no buys, earned pro points in multiple of these events, despite the fact that she wasn't, she had never played the format before of the event that she was playing. But magic is almost impossible for her in a lot of ways because she 
can't hold numbers and she can't think about the game in the same way. She doesn't have the same, I don't even know exactly what it is because there's something with spatial recognition that she really struggles with, but a lot of it kind of trickles down to various aspects of magic. And so what ends up happening is that you kind of formulate this game plan, but you're not, she's not able to kind of hold it turn to turn to turn. And so for me, I have, I recognize this thing is on the board. I don't have to then think about it all the time and every turn of the game, the way it feels like it gets described to me is that it's got to, everything needs to get reanalyzed again. And to just do that every turn of the game, first off is almost impossible, but it's just exhausting. And so it's what taxing. ends up, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What ends up happening is that it's just extremely mentally taxing. You're continually, you know, needing to basically do the exact same things over and over again. And at that point, you just kind of, there's something that needs to give. And so I think that for her, it was like, well, I can't just keep doing combat math every single turn. I'm not, I'm already bad at mental math. I'm already bad at holding all these numbers. I can't just keep analyzing all these things every turn. And so she'd have to kind of lean away from decks that are very combat oriented. And a lot of the decisions would kind of, just kind of be like attack with everything. This is not an attack turn. And you can't be elite like that for very clear reasons and that you're giving up huge equity. And so the best players in the world, they're very rarely missing that one point of damage or like, oh, I can get this through or, hey, I have a good bluff attack here. Like you can never get to that if there are certain things that you can't really process or focus on. And it just creates a situation where, you know, you're kind of capped in a lot of ways of you know, the, the best that you can be at this game. And it doesn't necessarily cap your success, especially in the short run, especially in a game with high variance, but you're not going to be making optimal plays anywhere near as often as you want. So there's just a lot of things that kind of go back to luck. So given what you said, do you think that's what separates the, the truly great players or the pro tour level players from the grinders or the SCG type of players is it those things is it that that intellectual horsepower that intuition or is it something else it's tough to say i mean there's always going to be some element of luck and so it could be it could very easily be that there's a grinder or a star city player that is the best player in the world or among the best players in the world i mean easily could be the case but i think there's a lot of factors that kind of come in and Magic is, is a great game, and there's a lot of different skills involved. I think that there was a period of time where some of the best players in the game were not having as much success on the Pro Tour level versus on, like, the Grand Prix level. So there was guys... There were guys in Magic that were just absolutely obliterating Grand Prix who were just doing okay on the Pro Tour. And that's because they were some of the best players in the world as far as technical play was it was involved like they could technically play as well as anyone if not better but they didn't necessarily have any creativity and they didn't necessarily like didn't have the same ability to think outside the box and so they'd run into some of the best players in the world in the later stages of the pro tours and they would find way like the the players that were actually slightly better than them at the time would find ways to outplay them in certain spots even though they were technically playing correctly and that you know players of that skill level who were then their opponents were able to deduce what they had basically at all times because they're playing in a very more or less abc way everything they're doing is is technically correct but it's never necessarily giving you something to think about um mm -hmm. and so again the they would still see success on the Pro Tours, but you'd see a lot of like top 32s and consistent caches as opposed to top eights and winning the event because they'd run into these players who were maybe not even as technically skilled as them, but close, and then who had this extra element. I think that that's part of it. Um, part of it comes from networking, connections, having a better team to be able to make you better. Um, that's a big part of it. And a lot of it's just kind of hard to say. Like, I think that a lot of the best players of all time are just technically better than everyone else. 
Um, and, and there's a reason why, you know, they, they've been able to have that consistent success at the top. But the gap isn't necessarily this huge thing. And so um, a lot of it will just kind of boil back down to things like luck and how that all plays out. Who were the key people that helped you on your magic journey? I mean, my magic journey is long. <laughs> it starts back in when you were 15, right? No, yeah. no, way before that. When I was 10. 1994 was when I first got into magic. And so a big part of of my magic development came in the fact that my fifth grade teacher basically turned the classroom into a working society where we had our own currency, our own forms of government, different shops, different things. So there was just a lot of things kind of going on to kind of turn our fifth grade classroom into the real world. And right after Pogs was the big fad, Magic was the big fad. And so everyone in the class, all the boys, all the girls were playing Magic and collecting Magic and trading Magic for our fake currency. And so it just kind of gave a, an opportunity to kind of learn the game and, you know, kind of get involved that way. Once it became, you know, sixth grade the following year, there was just me and one other kid left who played magic at all. And, and most people had moved on, but I found it fun. And so then finding, you know, a local game store where I could start, you know, going there. And um, I, for a couple of years, I would go to the Lucky Frog, um, which was the local game store, which was actually the same local game store. If you follow poker at all, I grew up very close to Justin Bonomo, who is now the leading money winner, I guess is the best way to put it in, in poker history. I think he's made like $60 million. I'm sorry, but, what city were you in? I'm not familiar with the lucky frog. That was in Alexandria, Virginia. So I was like 10 miles outside of Washington, DC. Okay. I don't believe it still exists or hasn't for a long time, but, um, yeah, so that's where I used to play. I was a very cocky kid. I think that Friday Night Magic didn't exist yet, but we had our weekly tournament, and I think I won 30-something of them in a row. And, you know, I was young and very brash in a lot of ways. And that, so I, I have to imagine that most of the both older kids and adults probably kind of hated me um, because, I, I mean, I... I was playing like turbo stasis type decks where people were old enough to remember those type of things and just really punishing people who didn't have necessarily real, real quote unquote decks. Um, this is, you know, this was before the pro tour. I think this was before pro tour one. I don't know. Pro tour one, I guess happened when I was first learning the game and that might've been 94, but yeah, it was, it was still in the infancy of all this stuff. So, um, yeah, the, that helped for a while, and then... So it was your fine. teacher, and it was also Justin? Is that the people that... Well, I, really... I didn't really know, know Justin. I was just name-dropping someone who went to my LGS. Got as, it, got as, it. He was a couple of years younger than me, and I was a kid. So I was 12, he was like 10. So it's not like we were anyone. It's just kind of funny that we both ended up becoming professional poker players from Magic from the same area had a lot of success obviously him now a lot more than me me and me a lot more than him a while ago it's been a long time since that was the case so um but yeah and then uh just finding more friends to kind of play with in a more local way as i started to get older um which again became a lot of poker players i actually i guess it was like brock parker and matt lindy who won a pro tour together with William Jensen, Huey, who then also moved into the area later on. That was as I started to get a little bit older. I might have been out of high school by then. I was probably like early college when he moved um, to the area, but spent a lot of time with him and Kyle Rose and spent a little bit of time with like Mike Long and other Magic players in that area as I, you know, was just kind of coming up in the game and still a kid. Um, and then I moved away from Magic for a long period of time. Like I was in, after college, I was playing poker and just 
basically wasn't playing magic at all until many years later um i actually got an invite because of poker to the pro tour in san diego in 2010 i hadn't played a pro tour in years at that point and that's when you know i started meeting some of like channel fireball people um you know i was really good friends with david williams who i met while he was trying to grind poker and qualify for the main event and i spent a lot of time working with him on poker before the 2004 main event i wasn't 21 yet but he was and so he went out there and ended up getting second in the main event and we became really close and so we started traveling to various poker events together and then he also got an inv invite to the same event in san diego so we went to that and so we were playing magic a lot together too and started collecting a lot of cards there um yeah and it was i think two pro tours later where the actual team channel fireball actually formed in amsterdam in 2010 and so then had the best testing team in the world to work on magic and uh just kept going from there i guess what's your current relationship with magic good question i don't know the answer um so my wife works at wizards um she is a product architect after being on the social team for a while um so we we moved out to washington at the end of 2019 where she had a contract position um being a community manager and so at the time I owned a house in Vegas where we moved from, we were renting out here and we couldn't really make any decisions because it was a one year contract and they did not give her any indication of what would happen until that full year was up when they extended her full time. And so at that point, the pandemic was in full swing, hadn't seen the house since the beginning of the pandemic. So it'd been like seven, eight months, didn't really even know what shape it was in because couldn't do any traveling and now had to figure out you know buying a house up here in washington where the market was maybe the worst of anywhere in the world and also selling our house from afar um but at that time they decided that i because she was getting picked up full time that i would not be able to play professionally anymore and so they didn't tell us that when she accepted the position, they actually said more like, I can't say they said literally the opposite, but it felt very clear that it was going to be in discussions and that they were going to work on something and make sure. And hopefully that wouldn't be the case. Um, they've made a lot of exceptions over the years where they've changed the rules because it's not like a hard, fast law or rule. Like they're trying to avoid sweepstakes rules or any kind of indication that I would have an unfair advantage by my wife working there. But they also have changed the rule for a bunch of different men who have worked there. I mean, most notably, I guess everyone would know that Ian Duke and Reed Duke being brothers, and it's obviously a, a very similar situation in a lot of ways, but they don't live together. So that, that's how that rule got changed. It's like, okay, well, we're not going to have the live together rule anymore. And so there's been a few other amendments similar to that in similar capacity. So I was under the impression that that was not going to be the case. And I was actually testing for my matches in the Magic Pro League when I found out that I wasn't going to be playing because it was in a few days at that point. And so um, it just kind of created a weird situation of I don't really know what to do with magic, I guess, um, especially having a lot of friends who were in the pro league and still playing and, um, you know, not being allowed to play competitively anymore. Definitely. So My you can't play, play in an RCQ or right. any competitive. Right. Well, yeah, because I, I would get a bunch of the benefits anyway from the Hall of Fame of being qualified for various things. But I can't I don't even think I can play in like the big side events. At tournament. I think there's like I'm pretty sure there's like a cap to what the prize pool can be. I'm not even sure what it is because I haven't tried. I also but haven't does been... the Hall of Fame give you an invite? I think that was that announced did, or did I misremember? I'm pretty sure that's the case. I mean, I definitely got an email saying I was invited to the last pro tour. But you're not allowed to play because of the spousal but I can't association. Play. Right. And so, um, yeah, I, I can't say that I don't play at all. I play 
sparingly on things like arena uh it'll usually be when someone i know posts a deck and i'm like that looks kind of fun i'll check that out and i'll play a few games the last set i drafted was well over a year ago um for a while after i wasn't able to play i continued kind of drafting and playing more but i don't know there's just it just i don't even want to say it was hard but also i know that the people who I was close to in a lot of ways have struggled a lot with the the past couple of years of trying to figure out what pro play even is and what's going on and what their future is. And in a lot of ways, I felt thankful that I kind of had the cord cut in the way that I did because I'm not sure how much I would have enjoyed the year or two afterwards. And so now it's a little bit harder again now that in-person pro tours are coming back, but I also... I feel more disconnected, I guess, from the game. And so I actually applied for a job at Wizards a couple of years ago to work in the play or in the yeah, the premier play to try to make the pro tour better and to bring back various things. And I got pretty deep into the interview process and then I think I just totally bombed it. Um the fact of the matter is I didn't know what I was doing as far as interviews are concerned, because I've never had an interview for a job in my life like i've never applied for a job um and so what ended up happening was i got because it was on video call i i was talking about these various things and like ideas and stuff that i think was all really good for 20 to 30 minutes and never got to talk about myself because the thing just ended and i just didn't realize that was a thing <laughs> and so um the whole selling yourself or yeah, selling yourself in a certain that way, so, that framework. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, well, that went really badly. I didn't realize that's how, inter like, cause like I got through the first couple rounds of interviews and it was, you know, answering a lot of questions and this felt more free form in some ways, but also didn't realize that there was like such a. But honestly, guess, as someone who's interviewed people for, for, for roles, I think that's also on the interviewer. Like whether it's this interview that we're having now or a job interview, if they, if the interviewer is not getting what their information they need, that's also on them. So it's also possible that they didn't think my ideas were as good as I, I think my ideas were really good for what it's worth, but I could be wrong. <laughs> like they could just totally disagree with me and they're like, well, they're not selling themselves and their ideas suck. So we're cutting this shorter, but I kind of find out afterwards that people I guess kind of know that interviews are short like that, that this was not this shouldn't have necessarily been a surprise to me and I'm like well whatever it is what it is I it mean, is what it is it was also yeah. a hard situation because I'm, I'm, I'm like I was pretty happy with my life like the stuff that I'm doing and the job I'm working like all this stuff is good yeah. it um, wasn't like I need this right like no, I need I'd be this taking to... a massive pay cut I'd be having to work way more hours with way more stress and there's part of me that at some point in my life would like to work on magic and be able to, you know, like it, it is very important to me to have other people get to experience a lot of the positive things that I've got to experience and making pro play the best that it can be felt like a real way to do that. Also when they put out the like specifications or whatever they're the things that they were looking for, I don't even know what that's called. Um, that's how, that's how many interviews the, and... the job description, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Whatever it's called. <laughs> When, well, the bullet points i'm like because I, i've seen other job listings before and it's just comical as someone who has not finished college and never had a real job to look through i'm like well i don't i meet one of these like 12 things and then i'm looking at this one i'm like i am overqualified for this job how does this exist because it's like all understanding numbers <laughs> doing spreadsheets like having a rich history of magic's background knowing about the pro play system and its various iterations. Yeah. Like, you you lived that for hell? like decades. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was like, uh, did someone just make a description of me and take off a few things and put it as a yeah. job listing? I'm like, how does this job exist? Like, as someone again who is in their late 30s and had never applied for a job, part of it was like, well, there'll never be a job that I actually am quote unquote qualified for. And I don't, I'm not really someone who wants to be like, I'm going to go sell myself, even though these people say that they don't really want me based on this stuff. And it's like, that just felt weird to me. So, and, and there really haven't, I mean, I've had work in some capacity, whether it's playing professional magic, professional poker, or, you know, various other things that I've done. 
to, I've never actually needed a job or wanted a job, so it's never actually made sense. But if you're going to give me a job working on the thing that I know the most about and the game that I know the most about, I'm going to listen, <laughs> you know? And so, it, yeah. So I almost think for you, they should have just skipped the interview. I, I mean, if I, I was the hiring manager what happened and I... a little bit more early on in the process, because again, I got to, I think the last interview stage, um, yeah. I, I don't know if there was some more of that earlier on. Cause you know, obviously I, I talked to their recruiter and he's like, they seemed like they were really impressed by me. Obviously I gave answers, but they also have some idea of who I am. And afterwards, when I didn't get the job, the recruiter called me. It's just like, you know, are there other jobs you might want here? Like, I want to keep you in mind. Like, it, which he was like super, super nice. Um, yeah. I haven't and you're heard like, no, not really. Ago, I kind of just want, heard anything, kinda, so. kinda just want this role, right? Is I did say said? that like, honestly, there aren't very many roles that I know about that I'd be happy to take, but I would always be happy to listen kind of thing. And again, I haven't heard from them since, and this has been yeah. over a year, but, um, you know, also my wife works there and is, you know, decently high up in the company. So at some point in the future, I, and, you know, all the people we hang out with are quote unquote work friends who all work at wizards and, um, you know, is, uh, is there a possibility to make connections, but yeah, sure. But is there a possibility to work in other card games? I just see so many people, including Patrick, yes. whom we spoke about or, lsv like they're just doing a kind of magic adjacent things right right and and that's exactly what you'd expect from anyone who actively wants to do that kind of work but that's never been that's not what i've ever wanted like the mm. idea was if i can work on magic and make magic the best it can be because it's right. given me everything it's given me all mm. of my friendship and made me close to my family i met my wife like and just so many things in my life are all because of magic like i believe I know we talked about beforehand that we were talking about like the comparison between magic and poker. And obviously there's a lot of different similarities with the game and reading people and just doing math and all of these things that are just kind of basic and aren't, and aren't super great answers because the, honestly there aren't a ton of similarities, but the biggest help from magic to poker was when I played my first world series of poker final table, the one on ESPN that I ended up winning I can't even imagine how much pressure I would have been under if I didn't have experience as a 16 year old or an 18 year old playing the top eight of a pro tour under the lights and cameras. I don't remember feeling any stress or pressure playing on that ESPN table. And it, it just seems unimaginable. To, like it just never crossed my mind until after the fact, like, wait, I was just playing huge stakes and a big stage, a big, like, and it didn't cross my mind until after the fact. And I, I just don't, think that that would have been possible without that previous experience from magic as well so um again like i said if i if i took this job at magic which was pretty high up it, it wasn't like a, an entry level position or anything that i was applying for but it, it would be again a lot more hours and a pay cut from what i'm doing right now and the thing is when it comes to the gambling world like it's not something i want to do forever and having the various other benefits and ability to rise up and um you know just kind of both contribute more and um, learn more about myself. All of that stuff feels valuable as I get older. But the the real incentive again was it was to make magic the best that it can be. And to, I mean, first off, I have a lot of friends who still play magic. So making pro magic great again is not just awesome for future generations. It's still awesome for the people that I care about too. So um, mm -hmm. there there's a lot of reasons to try to focus on magic and if i got offered the same type of job without needing to know the background for a game like pokemon or you know any other game that again i've played no other games i'm not a gamer i'm not a video gamer i played magic i played poker <laughs> those are the games i played um i of course i would listen but no, you know it's it's just hard to kind of yeah. apply for the stuff that you, you I know what you want so that that's important and also you're not driven by the I can infer you're not driven by the financial aspect of it because you said you're just leaving money on the table doing it or or you're taking a cut really doing it. So it's really yeah. for something more, I would say, like mission based or more pure, like about I mean, making a difference. Don't get it twisted. Like if they offered me too low a salary, I just wouldn't take it. It's not like I'm doing this <laughs> altruistically. Sure, sure. Like the salary, it was, it was a good it's, salary. It's, it's, just, a, it's a combination yeah. of factors. Right, That's right. what I'm saying. There yeah. was a minimum amount that I would need to be working a nine to five period, no matter what it was. Right. Like mm -hmm. I very much value my time. I very much value my freedom. There's a reason why I got into poker, but right. um, yeah. But I think you're also someone who would potentially just be very frustrated by corporate structure. Everything that I've heard yes. about Wizards, 
yes. suggests that you may not enjoy working there where you basically have to put up with a lot of stuff yes. given your personal value system just to well, do the things that you want to do. I mean, I made it clear that I thought that, that it would be really hard for me if I ever was very confident about an idea, knew how to execute it, blah, blah you know, et cetera. And mm -hmm. the answer was just, no, we can't do that. Or, you know, it, your stuff just gets ignored. And as a volunteer for Wizards in the past, when they've kind of asked for various information from people who might be able to assist with certain things or have, um, you know, certain experiences, that, that's been a lot of what I've heard is kind of the feedback of, you know, maybe there's someone out there, there'd be a couple of people at Wizards who are like, oh yeah, we strongly agree with what Eric's saying. We're going to try to push this idea. They just got like, no, we're not doing that. And it's just like, okay, well, that would be, that's really frustrating, you know, because for very obvious reasons. So don't need to get into that. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, that was exactly what I told, because my wife was asking me to apply to Wizards for years. And I'm like, as soon as this happens to me, I'm going to lose my shit. Like, <laughs> I, I, how am I going to handle that? Like, if I'm telling right. someone, this is my job now to tell you how to handle this situation and you get told, no, that we're not going to do that. And you're just like, this is the way to handle this. Like, let's do it. <laughs> like, well, no, we're not going to spend another, you know, we're already spending 1.2 million. We're not going to spend 1,202,000. It's just like, that's, ridiculous of course we should spend 0 0.01 percent more right. like I right mean, so those type of things i'm like yeah i'm not going to be able to handle that at all but i will try <laughs> so i, I mean yeah, i, I don't mean know. life is about putting is about working with other people in yes. a lot of ways not all the time but but well, in a lot of with ways people at wizards is incredible and i you know that was my favorite part actually of the pro league was that we got oh, to was. go to wizards and sit and have meetings and um you know, a lot of the people I've known for a long time who we'd have the meetings with, the problem is once you get a level or two above or you get into Hasbro stuff and you yep. start talking about budget or, I mean, stuff that I don't even know what's actually going on. Obviously, I'm mm -hmm. inferring stuff. But mm -hmm. once you get into those situations where it's just out of the control of the – like, because I know that the people that I've interacted with at Wizards are incredibly smart, incredibly talented, care about magic an absurd amount, extremely hardworking – but this stuff is not getting done. And there's a reason why. It's not because of them. Or when, you know, the Pro Tour budget or other things get cut, it's not because of the people who I know who no, are responsible it's the for the Pro Tour. It's, it's, it's the levels above, uh, you know, you, it's I mean, designed I don't even have to way. talk to them. You can see it in their faces when they're talking about these things. Like, they're yeah. frustrated about this. Do you think they want to yeah. cut budget? Like, no, of course not. Like, they want their mm. budget for each thing to be the maximum it can be and make it the best possible because... <laughs> That's what's fun for them. That's what they care about. There's a right. reason why they have these jobs. It's not to like figure out where to penny pinch. I mean, it mm -hmm. is because they literally have to, but like, you know, those, totally. those type of situations that are just out of people's controls. And, you know, the general public, I think, is generally going to be mad at the faces that they actually see. And you're mm -hmm. going to assume. And again, maybe I'm just wrong about how things work. And it really is that they're just pure evil and this and that. But <laughs> I mean, very clearly it's not. And so... Or there's no way they'd continue working these jobs if that were the case. They want to make positive change. They want to make the best products that they can make. And, and it's just clear as day how passionate and talented these people are. And sometimes you just don't have control over situations. And like the fact that they're able to continue doing what they're doing despite that is something that I wasn't sure that I could do. And so it was very concerning for me if I were to get a job. I want to make sure this podcast is about you, not me. I, I want to avoid going into my diatribes about wizards, having worked with wizards uh, for a very long time uh, on the on the coverage side, and also now as a as a creator. But let's skip that. Let's skip that. Um, the the last com the last question I want to ask you. Let's leave on a a more light lighthearted note. Is it true that you were the first person to call Gab Nassif Yellow Hat? What's the story behind that? It's funny. I was, went to the Mariners game with Mike Turian two days ago, and we were talking about exactly that. Um, oh, we for talking, real? Okay. Well, we were talking about a lot of different things, and like first we were talking about the team pro tour. Like my wife asked what his best finish was, and obviously he won the pro tour. Now we we're talking about team pro tours, and I actually met Nasif at the team pro tour that I think think he finished second in Dakai's team. And he was wearing the silly yellow hat and I started calling him yellow hat and kind of integrated him with a lot of the Americans because he was fun and funny and friendly. 
Um, but I also think that I was just like, as far as I know, and this might not be true because obviously I don't know everyone, but as far as I know, especially in the pro scene, I was the first one to kind of bring the Americans and the non-Americans together to test. Like mm. for many years in the 90s, you would have the New York group and the Florida group and the California group and the German group and the French. Like it was just, I mean, maybe there were more European countries that were working together that I, I'm not aware of. Um, obviously but the there's Americans a... were like, they stayed and together it was very and they were also regionalized too with a lot yeah. of the American stuff. And then I started teaming with Camille Cornelison for team stuff and brought in Nassif. And then we started testing with Kai, me and Brian Kibler and Ben Rubin tested with Kai for a little bit. And then all of us kind of worked together with your move games and, you know, especially as being someone who is younger and all of this kind of like internet chat room type things and more ability to connect with other people as, technology kept getting better and you know it might have made more sense that people who were 10 years older than me at the time when i'm 18 or 20 or what yeah no i must have been like 17 or 18 actually at the time um we're not doing as much of this but you know that, that was something that i you know I, I didn't really know any better obviously i didn't have a big testing reach you know regionalized group like for the team pro tour i was going to play with kyle rose who was also from virginia and then we're like who's the best player left and Camille had just been crushing the last couple of pro tours didn't seem like I had ever heard him say a word to anyone so I'm like see if I can get this guy's contact information and reach out to him had no idea like I'm glad the show catfish didn't exist at the time because we could have easily just been showing up at a pro tour thinking that we're playing with Camille who we've never really interacted with before and just like yeah sorry he was never actually coming but um but yeah, so the three of us teamed together in that pro tour, played against Nassif's team, ended up losing to Kai's team in the last round to miss top four. Um, and we finished like sixth or seventh. And yeah, and then Yellow Hat just kept sticking. Like I, I became closer friends with uh, Huey and Brock and um, Matt Lindy. And I, everyone just kind of called him Yellow Hat and he always wore the Yellow Hat. And mm. I, I'm shocked that it's, still stuck 22 years later but um yeah is it still the same same literally the same hat or is he just upgraded it it just looks the same i have no idea i don't know either i think it's the same hat but the the odds that he didn't lose it in 20 some years are just so low it seems so, so it, hard yeah i don't i don't actually know for 100 percent if that's true um because he doesn't even bring it or i think he says that he usually brings it he doesn't wear it very often though i think so he's it's only like a good luck charm kind of thing yeah like, I think he might have worn it at, like, Worlds at some point or and maybe a couple he other did, events, yeah. but I don't think, like, I don't think it's an every event type it's thing. It's not, like, maybe every event. single time. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, honestly, I don't know. Good question. Yeah. But that's that's really interesting that you were the connector because Nassif is really known for being, like, an American player almost because <laughs> yeah. because of his... Um, I think he has some very famous partnerships. Was was it with uh, Herbert Holtz and, like, certain people that really uh, yeah, helped him on his career? Yeah, Detroit connection, and I was... Nassif's wife of the last, I think they've been married for 10 plus years now, um, was live, we lived together for a while beforehand. And so, um, yeah, he, I think, I don't know if I could say he met her through me, but I think you're in the same circles. Kind of, yeah. 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 So, okay. um, yeah, a lot of connection. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hey, well, Eric, it was such a pleasure having a, Thank you for even affording me the time, like to have two hours to sit down with you is just incredible. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time. And I wish you all the best with um, your future endeavors and the, the recovery, of course. I appreciate that. And it's been fun. Thank you for tuning in to Humans of Magic. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button below and leave a comment. That helps tell YouTube that you appreciate what I do and allows us to spread the word to other people. It goes a long way. It really does. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.